Hello and welcome to this talk on breathing for disease resistance in Peñaus Banamey. My name is Marcelo Salazar and I am the Scientific Director of Benchmark Genetics Colombia and we have a breeding nucleus for Peneus Banamey. Diseases have always been one of the main concerns for the shrimp industry, starting in the 1980s, 1990s with the first virus described, which is IHHMV, a minimum impact virus that is now still OI listed. The list of pathogens have always been increasing. In 1983, we encountered TSB Taura syndrome virus from Ecuador. It had a relevant impact, but it's a success story of genetics uh, because we were able to produce resistant animals easily. Heritability was very high, and that opened the way for genetics to be a tool in the uh, treatment for on controlling for disease resistance in shrimps. Uh, in 1998, we encountered a different virus, white spot, a virus which had a major impact. It went to all the producing countries, and it was much more difficult to control with genetics. It had low heritability, a negative correlation with growth, and we have been using several tools to be able to control that. In 2013, we were dealing with a different pathogen, not a virus this time, but a bacteria, a bacteria with a toxin that was causing acute hepatopancreatic necrosis disease. The impact of this disease, of this pathogen, is still catastrophic. And we don't have resistant line jets, but we are finding another ways to manage as controlling pond soil, keeping very well conditions for the animals. And our next and last but not least pathogen is Enterocytone hepatopenae, which is a microsporidia fungus that is causing severe impact in all the countries also, and we are learning how to manage. Before I started to talk about how are we going to do selective breeding, let's see how the animal uh, is able to defend himself. The shrimp or all animals have two ways to defend a, against an invading pathogen. One is resistant and the other one is tolerance. And in the shrimp, you use resistance or tolerance indistinctively without knowing what does it mean. Resistance is the ability to limit the pathogen load. It's an active immune system activity against the pathogen that tries to limit the reproduction and control the pathogen. It's like a war. Let's fight the pathogen. While in tolerance, the animal says, oh, I'm not going to fight that pathogen. I'm just going to learn how to live with it. To, com to be able to live without losing anything and the two of them living together. So there are two strategies for dealing with this and we have to understand that. A resistant animal could be negative, a tolerant animal could be a, a carrier of the pathogen and could be transmitted the disease without being symptomatic. Talking about disease resistance, is that the only answer? No. When we are talking about pandemias or epidemics or diseases, we have to take into account there are only always three or more players. The main players are the environment that we can control, the shrimp or the animal that we can control, and the pathogen that we cannot control. And it's the interchange of these three, the agent, the shrimp, and the environment, that will, that will give us the disease and the severity of the disease. So we have to understand that selective breeding is not the only answer, but it's a key tool. Management practices are still the best tools for pathogen control. And we cannot think that because we have an animal that is resistant, we'll be able to resist everything. If we don't give them good oxygen, good feed, good pond soil, good conditions, they will die anyway. And resistance can also be lost. So we have to continue be monitoring what is going on. The pathogen can evolve. And we saw that in COVID, during, you saw that there was a lot of new variants that were resistant to the, to the vaccines to the, uh, that were easier to transmit. So the pathogens are always trying to find ways to evolve. And we have to look at that. And can also be selecting for another traits that are negatively correlated with resistance. And we can be losing resistance. So now going to what you want to, to hear is how to control the diseases in the farms. Well, when we are going to be breeding for disease resistance, it's a multi-step approach. We first how to define what is the real benefit of selection. If there is a pathogen or a, or a condition that can be controlled easily with management, we shouldn't go into 
uh, this, uh, into breeding for disease resistance or for that condition. For example, we shouldn't be breeding animals for low oxygen because it's easier to increase the oxygen conditions in the ponds. And if we breed for low oxygen tolerant animals, we'll probably be selecting for animals that don't grow. So once we define, okay, this, there is a real benefit for selection, we have to see if there is genetic variation in resistance. What does it mean? We have to see if the animals will be able to resist more or less. If we have survivors, if we have animals that die really early, animals that die late, that means that they are different and that we can start selecting for the best animals. We also have to have a standardized method for selection of resistance or tolerance. We, that means that we have to have challenge tests. And we have to look at the correlation with other traits. Is it affecting reproduction? If I select for this pathogen, will it be negatively correlated with another pathogen or with, resist or with growth or will be positively correlated? Now go to the techniques that we have. We have several strategies. The first one being mass selection. In mass selection, we have all of our animals together and we infect them. And we look at a week later, four or five days later, what survived and we reproduce the survivors. This is a really effective technique for selection for, survive, for resistance. It would be used initially in Taurus syndrome virus with very good results. 15% increase in survival per generation. However, there is a downside to it, is that their animals are not going to be clean and it could be, we could be reintroducing the disease or we could be transmitting the disease to other countries or to other places that are free. The results are very good. We can see here, we have animals that were susceptible. We have animals that were resistant against white spots selected by my selection and the hybrid had its survival that was intermediate between the two different lines. What if we want to do selection, but without having the problems of having contaminated animals? How do we do that? Well, that's where the family and individual selection come to play. We have, how does it work? We have families, different families. We have the yellow, the blue, the green, the gray, several families together, and we infect them with the virus. At the end of the test, we count the number of animals that survived from each family, and then we'll be able to determine which is the best family. And in this case, the best family was the green one. So what do we do? We say, okay, we'll use the siblings that were not infected as breeders, and then we'll be able to increase the resistance in each generation. But in all, in most of the challenge tests, not all of the animals from the family survive. We have, let's say, 50% that survive. It means that we have a chance, a chance of one to two to get in an animal that was really resistant or one that was susceptible. So how do we do, how can we improve uh, this type of selection? Easy, we just, or not easy, then we go to looking at the DNA or the genetic makeup of the animals. How do we do that? Okay, we have the animals, our families, our green family, and we not only see the phenotype, which is if they survive or not, we look at the genotypes. What is the DNA component of that? What is the, the, the code that they have? And we try to find markers that are a, associated with the different phenotypes. For example, in this case, we can have this gray fish that has the low capital letter M and Q, and that could be the best one, while this one is the worst one. So in, instead of just looking blindly for the siblings, we genotype the siblings and try to see if we can find the animals that are better. This works really good when we have a, one marker that explains a lot of the variation that happens in, for example, in the salmon with IPN, where only one change in a nucleotide in a letter was able to explain like seven, 30 or 40 percent of the, of the variation of the resistance of the animals. However, we are not so lucky in shrimps. We don't have a QTL. A QTL is one to put it simple, is one or two letters that are associated with resistance or susceptibility. In shrimps, we have a lot of letters that, can, that could be associated. It's not that we have, that we won the lottery and found only one. 
we have to look for several. So how do we do that? How do we look for a lot of changes in the genome? We use the famous called a SNP chip. What is a SNP chip? A SNP chip is a technology that allows us to look for a lot of the DNA positions in the genome of the shrimp, uh, 15,000, 30,000, 50,000, and to be able to say, okay, this animal has this 30,000 different letters in these positions, and this is good or not. A SNP chip will only give us the genetic makeup. What we do with it is we use it for uh, typing our animals that are resistant or susceptible, and we look for differences. What do we see when we do a SNP chip, for example? We find this. We find a lot of letters. This animal had in one position AA. Remember that the DNA code is only four letters. ACTG. So everything is pretty boring. ACTG. In this position, uh, this animal had A. In this position, it only had T. In this position, it only had C. But in this one, it has CA. We can use this to look for disease resistance, or for use it also, we use it a lot for paternity and pedigree assignment. How do we do that? If we have a putative male with this combination and a putative female with this combination, we can try to find, and, and, and it's an interesting game, which animal could be the, the progeny of these two. So for example, let's get this animal 71. Could it be the progeny of these two animals? Or let's see, oh, oh, in this position, it has a CC. Both parents had a TT, so it cannot be a, a progeny of these two. And we can go line by line until we find one animal, F59, that it's in every position, it can be the progeny of the two. And that's the way that we assign paternity. So aside from using it, for determining the makeup for genetic resistance, we can also use it for determining paternity testing and a pedigree assignment. So for to test this in the genetic resistant environment or background, we did an experiment for white spot in which we decided to cross, to use pure resistant lines and a hybrid lines that I showed you before with an intermediate survivals. And what we did was we we're trying to see if our genomics approach worked. So we divided that population into two. One part of the population was challenged and the other part was kept as putative breeders, as breeder candidates. We challenged the animals. We measured the survival of each animal at what time it died, if it survived, and we genotyped them. We did a SNP chip. With this SNP chip, we look at which ATCG were associated with the animals that died first and with the animals that died later, or the survivors. So we were able to say, okay, we believe that this combination of nucleotides is good for disease resistance against white spot, or we think that this one is bad for disease resistance. And we had a, clean, a line that was clean for white spot, that had a good genetic makeup and had not been infected, but we wanted to do a proof of concept. So we took the animals and said, okay, I'm going to cross the ones that I think are very good together. So th those will be my good animals. I'm going to cross the animals that were very bad and those are going to be my bad animals. And I'm going to do some random selection. They will choose how to cross and we'll reinfect that. We did that, and that's what I, I found. We found the animals that were being crossed because we believed that they were very good at selection, had a survival about 50%. The animals that we thought were bad at survival, just because we're looking at the DNA, we didn't have any more information, just the DNA, had a survival of less than 27%, and the random was in the middle. So the experiment had a very good proof of concept meaning that just looking at the DNA, we're able to decide or to define which animals were going to be good or which animals were going to be bad. And this is a very excellent, very good results that can be applied to any other disease. In this, we can select animals without infecting them 
and making sure that they have the genetic makeup that we want. So for you, for, to summarize what we've been doing in terms of resistance, I, before I show you a timeline of the diseases, I'm going to show you a timeline of the tools that we have been using starting in 1994 with mat selection against TSV, resistance in pond selection. 1997, we started what I talked to you about the family breeding program, uh, combining not only mass selection, but using the selection of uninfected siblings and being able to look for another traits. For example, we, we were getting interested not only in survival, but also in growth. So we were able to look, select for growth and TSB resistance. In 2008, we started playing again, going back to mass selection for white spot. And 2017, we started using all the SNPs and pedigree assignment with molecular markers. And in 2018, we have been using sel genomic selection initially for white spot and apins. And I'm going to use it now for EHP. Talking about EHP, I want to show you the last experiments that we are doing. This is one of the diseases that is affecting heavily Asia, India, and other countries. And we have been testing initially our lines. We have uh, some lines that are our pure growth lines that in a challenge test show really poor results. This is the negative control. This is the this is one of the this is our negative control. And this is the two lines that are really, really poor performers. This is one of the lines that we have that this is the SPF line and this is one of the resistant lines that we have. So Looking at this, we saw that we had a very bad lines, a, no, bad lines for, a, a, they were very good for growth, but they were not good at resistance for HP. But we had a, a line that had, that showed promise. We repeated the experiments with different lines, and in this we got very results. If you can see, most of the animals were dead here, uh, while we had several survivors and the, and the mortality curve was less steep. So we have some lines that are very good, especially this one. And this is our negative control. But what is very interesting is that it, we also found some animals that were able to grow the same as the non-infected control and survive. So we believe that we have a very good material to start genomic selection for enterocytone hepatopene, and this is what we are doing now. The idea of the shrimp breeding and, and the shrimp management is to go from the domestication of wild animals, and we are now here. So we've been going from wild animals, domesticated them, uh, making them tame animals, doing selective breeding, in which we try to do a cumulative incremental improvements. So we have specialized lines for different traits. You have always been listening that we say that one size does not fit all. So we have lines for growth, we have lines that are more resistant, lines that can combine growth and resistance to certain pathogens. And we are using now a SNP chip for the optimal selection of productive traits. And now the idea is to use new biotechnology methods such as CRISPR, CASPR, that, but that should be another different webinar because that's very, very long to explain. But the idea is to get a super shrimp that can give us the growth and the production that all producers in the world need. So thank you very much. Hey, our idea is to produce robust and safe animals, meaning that they are not contaminated, that they're free from disease, but that they can tolerate or resist the different pathogens and different conditions. And this is my team that I want to uh, give thanks for all the hard work. We are located in Cartagena. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. I'll send the email in a later presentation. Thank you very much.